good afternoon. Um, so I'm David Ali, the uh, CEO at, uh, at EPA Victoria, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our first Caring for Country online event with Barangi Gunja Land Council and the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Council. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands we are meeting on today. And I know some of you have been putting them in the chat. Um, and I'm currently uh, on the lands of the Wandri people, the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. For those who don't know, Ipa Victoria is a member-driven organisation which connects, empowers and celebrates Victoria's public service sector. And today's event, and, and as, well, as, as well as the Caring for Country series, are part of that mission. Together with our Aboriginal Advisory Committee, we want to provide a safe and inclusive space for traditional owners and the public purpose sector to work together and enable Aboriginal self-determination. So thank you for joining us, and especially if this is your first IPA Victoria event. And I know almost 400 people have registered for this event, which is, which is fantastic. And I really want to welcome those of you from other states and territories. And so we're very grateful that you've all made the time to attend. As an organisation, we, we are proud of who we are and what we offer. So, uh, so please take some time out um, after the session or during the session um, to, uh, to visit our website and, uh, and even consider joining as a member. So I'd like to hand over to our host for this afternoon, Suzanne Coates. And Suzanne is a, is a proud Yorta Yorta woman and she's currently Acting Director, Aboriginal Self-Determination at the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. So please join me in welcoming Suzanne. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, we seem to have a bit of a lag on that um, at the moment. Stuart, hello, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. That's good. Um, perhaps you could begin with... Um, uh, uh, writing was going to start. She back? No, she's not back, Andrew. Oh, Suzanne's back. Uh, David, it's Rodney Carter. Just wondering if I could assist Susie. In the... um, yep, that's, that's a good idea. Yes, Thank please. you so much, Rodney. Right. Yes, yes, please, Rodney. Um, um, uh, sorry, we just had some technical difficulties and uh, Susie's just struggling with the uh, um, data, I guess. We need better... Uh, uh, NBN across the, the state. I'm, I'm extremely um, proud to uh, uh, be here today um, as the chair of the Victorian uh, Aboriginal Heritage Council and we want to commend the work that the Institute uh, uh, has done in its own right but increasingly as it engages um, traditional owners around the state in their own forms of leadership and they contribute to uh, um, I believe a, a greater, broader policy administration discussion. But today we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Stuart uh, Haridon, um, a traditional owner from the, the Wimmera uh, area, and, and shortly he'll um, uh, tell you a bit about what caring for country means to him. But I just wanted to share with you first that I'm extremely proud of what Council has done over the last decade to empower traditional owners and resolve the injustice to our people by appointing registered Aboriginal parties as custodians and managers of their cultural heritage. As part of Council's work promoting the importance of caring for country and cultural heritage, it plays a central role. This relates to Council's responsibilities under the Act and three points are to promote public awareness and understanding of Aboriginal cultural heritage in Victoria, to advise the Minister in relation to the protection of Aboriginal cultural heritage in Victoria and to advise the Minister about measures to promote the role of Aboriginal people in the protection and management of Aboriginal cultural heritage in the administration of the Act. So, you know, what does that really mean? Council itself is undertaking a body of work to talk to the community about the importance of traditional owners caring for country and cultural heritage. This engagement through social media, radio, conferences and forums will support a broader move by Council to further strengthen, strengthen Victoria's existing legislative support for traditional owners. The Act, which was formed in 2006, provides protection of Aboriginal cultural heritage in Victoria. 
It supports registered Aboriginal parties as the representatives of the traditional owners, custodians and first peoples to once again take their rightful place as the primary guardians, keepers and knowledge holders of Aboriginal cultural heritage of Victoria. The registered Aboriginal party is appointed by the Victorian Aboriginal Council, not the government. The council is an independent statutory authority made up of traditional owners from across the state. The council appoints a registered Aboriginal party and it is the registered Aboriginal party that represents traditional owners and holds decision-making responsibilities under the Act for the protection, management and preservation of Aboriginal cultural heritage on their country. Council is developing a discussion paper on proposed legislative reforms to the Aboriginal Heritage Act of 2006. This paper has already been considered by registered Aboriginal parties and will be broadly circulated amongst key traditional owner stakeholders. While Victoria has good Aboriginal cultural heritage legislation, it still does not meet the standards of the United Nations Declaration on the rights of Indigenous people in a number of respects. The legislation in place for the Commonwealth in other states and territories is well below even the Victorian standard. For this reason, Council is working with traditional owners and heritage organisations across the country to build momentum to raise the standards of Aboriginal cultural heritage legislation throughout Australia. This not only helps Victoria's traditional owners, but also helps our Indigenous brothers and sisters everywhere. This includes work around the current review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, defines standards for state and territory Aboriginal cultural heritage legislation, and building strengthening culture into the revised closing the gap targets. All of these things are fantastic and they wouldn't be possible if there weren't people such as Stuart Harradon that's gonna be sharing some of his knowledge on caring for country uh, with us today. And the council's extremely pleased to support the Caring for Country program. Thank you. All right, and we don't quite have uh, Susie back on the line. So we might, if it's possible, jump straight into um, Stuart, um, your, your presentation um, I'll get that up on screen for everyone. Yeah, thanks for that. And um, <laughs> I just want to acknowledge, um, yeah, traditional owners from all over country. Um, I'm speaking from uh, Dimboola um, in Wajabala country. And um, yeah, I acknowledge all the elders and uh, traditional owners from all over the state and all over the area and uh, thanks for having me here. So um, I've just got a bit of a, a slideshow, I guess, to, to help me sort of run through uh, some of the, uh, the information that um, I'd like to sort of pass on to everyone. And uh, I think, um, yeah, I'll also acknowledge too, um, yeah, thanks um, for Rodney's introduction there as well. Um, obviously, you know, what's happening in terms of, um, you know, the protection of cultural heritage in Victoria overall, um, like, like you mentioned, um, you know, it's probably the you know, strongest legislation uh, in Australia in terms of protecting Aboriginal heritage, but at the same time, there's a lot of um, areas that can be improved upon as well. So um, that's, that'll be a, a part of my presentation as well from our perspective. Um, as uh, traditional owners. So um, I might just uh, start running through the slides there. The first photo I've got there is actually um, Barangigadjin, which is the uh, the Wimmer River. And um, our corporation is named after uh, Wimmer River. It's the, uh, I guess, the lifeblood of um, uh, much of the country that we look after. Um, yeah, so you probably run through, start running through the, the slides there. Um, so yeah, just a bit of background. Um, uh, when I talk about Wajabalik people, it's a collective term to describe um, uh, the, the two main uh, 
language groups from our area, so as the Wagaya and the Jabajali uh, speaking peoples. And um, our corporation is essentially um, made up of the uh, Wajabalik, um, Jabwa, Jabwajali, Wagaya and Jupagalt peoples. And um, you can see that in relation to some of the other uh, groups on that map there that um, uh, yeah, we're, in, we're in an area uh, bordered sort of around um, the Gunjichmara people, Japarung people, Jajarung, um, Wamba Wamba, Lachi Lachi, and a number of other groups as well. Um, and the next map here shows the uh, the area. Um, oh, sorry, I think there's a message that's popped up. Um, the map is not showing only the first page. So I seem to be getting it pretty well. Um, but um, I'll just run through this uh, second map. Um, so this is the uh, essentially the wrap area, uh, which pretty much mirrors our Indigenous land use agreement area through native title as well. So um, so in, in the north, um, we're roughly sort of bordered around Owen to the north, um, Sea Lake, um, Donald area, down to Ararat and then up over uh, Garyward or Grampians across to um, Balmoral and places like that across to the South Australian border. So I do believe um, our RAP area or Registered Aboriginal Party area is um, the largest in the state. So it's um, one of the yeah, one of the challenges we do have, which I'll get into later. Um, I was just going to run through, um, I guess, try to describe our country a little bit for people who might not be familiar with it. So um, one of the uh, places that um, oh, yeah, we have a a number of special places in our country. Um, so I won't obviously go into all of them, we'll be here all day. But um, yeah, one of the places um, that we have here on this first um, blurry photo, I suppose, um, thanks to my young um, photo skills and um, uh, PowerPoint skills, I should say, uh, is um, Mount Arapiles or, or Durite as we know it. So um, uh, that is one of our special places, which is a, um, uh, sort of a, a, a lone sort of um, rocky mountain, um, sort of in the Wimmera Plains, I suppose. So some people sort of know it as um, the Wimmera's Uluru, I suppose, from when you see it from a distance. If we uh, keep going. Uh, another one of our special places is um, Ebenezer Mission, um, which a, a lot of our mob um, uh, come from, I guess. Yeah, so most uh, Wajabalik people or people from our mob um, have ancestors who um, were put onto Ebenezer Mission Station. Uh, for people who don't know much about the, uh, you know, the, the mission um, uh, setups in, in Victoria, there's a number of different mission stations and uh, around the state and um, Ebenezer, just north of Dimboola, at Antwerp um, was one of them. And uh, that's the remaining, or um, uh, the restored uh, church that um, uh, is, um, I believe one of the last remaining sort of mission buildings left standing around the state as well. And uh, yeah, obviously a special place to us because it was also a, um, uh, before the mission station was set up, that was one of the main uh, ceremony places as well. So, uh, yeah, with the next photo, um, part of our country, um, we've got a, quite a varied landscape. We have uh, mountain ranges, plains, uh, riverlands, lakes, and um, but also semi-arid desert areas. So we also have um, places um, called well, Little Desert National Park, um, Wiperfeld, and Big Desert Parks as well. So. Um, and they're quite important to us um, in our stories as well. Um, that might have been an additional one that I didn't delete. 
Um, okay, and um, part of our country um, that we're involved in at the moment, um, not necessarily you know, through uh, RAP status so much as um, I guess uh, joint um, uh, sort of uh, partnership approach with Parks Victoria, as well as uh, Gunditch Mirring and Eastern Mar Aboriginal Corporations is uh, Gary Word or Grampians. And um, yeah, that's a, a nice photo of um, part of the um, Northern Range there as well. Um, so that's another place that um, is very special to our mob. Now, just a bit of background in terms of uh, Barringa Gadjan Land Council or BGLC for short, is um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, we represent the traditional owners from the Wajabala, Jawa, Jawa Jali, Wagai and Jupagalt family groups. Uh, and um, the, I guess our, our mob were recognised through the native title consent determination in 2005. And um, that was the, probably the first um, successful native title uh, process um, uh, in southeastern Australia, as far as I can work out. Um, and we also, yeah, obviously have the um, uh, the, the the RAP status or regi regi registered Aboriginal Party status under the um, Aboriginal Heritage Act as well, which is um, uh, the main sort of uh, focus for the presentation today. But um, yeah through uh, both native title and um, you know, Aboriginal Heritage Act processes, um, uh, BGLC is recognised as the representative group uh, over our area. Now, um, for those who don't know much about RAPs or registered Aboriginal parties, I suppose through the Aboriginal Heritage Act, I think um, Rodney sort of um, basically covered it earlier, but. Um, yeah, you know, really, um, it's about recognising, you know, traditional owners and the people who look after and are the traditional owners of that particular country. So um, there are a number of wraps over the state now, and um, it's an ongoing process. Uh, we still have to, a few of our groups still need to work out boundary issues and things like that. But I think that's an ongoing process and that will, will be worked out eventually. So the RAPs basically act as um, primary source of advice and knowledge for the, the government and um, Aboriginal Victoria um, in matters relating to you know, Aboriginal heritage protection. And um, I guess, you know, just a bit more background, I suppose Aboriginal cultural heritage includes, you know, I guess your tangible sort of um, artifacts and objects, ancestral remains, it can also be the intangible heritage, which are uh, around um, stories, um, particular um, stories around places that tell people what they can and can't do in particular areas and um, language, you know, song and dance, things like that as well. So um, it's quite a, a large sort of um, component of our culture that um, can be protected through the Act. And I'll just um, touch, I suppose, on some of the challenges and issues that we um, we face um, as a as a rap. And um, one of the first ones is, um, I, I guess, there are limited, you know, uh, there's limited funding and resourcing uh, for our organisations in order to um, carry out some of our duties. So um, it's it's um, certainly based on a fee for service basis in terms of um, you know, what we do is basically providing, um, you know, advice, which is, um, you know, a service that can, can be uh, remunerated. So, but, but um, we don't certainly have a lot of funding and resourcing to be able to do what we do. And it's an ongoing challenge to be able to keep up with that. And, and also uh, capacity building within our community um, in order to provide, I guess, you know, um, jobs or job opportunities for people to work in cultural heritage in our country. We don't necessarily have um, the income or the, the I guess, the, the, the processes that, you know, through development that um, enable us to create a fee for service, or, um, you know, situation is fairly limited in our area compared to say um, other areas of the state where development is, you know, fairly, fairly much an ongoing process. So um, 
there, there's certainly a, some of our main issues there. Um, and being a, you know, such a large area to cover, um, that in terms of time and uh, resources to, yeah, I guess cover off on all of the different parts of country is quite a challenge for us as well. And obviously, um, in terms of some of the processes we need to follow through the Aboriginal Heritage Act, we don't often have a lot of time to, in order to do proper consultation with traditional owners on you know matters that affect them. So it certainly becomes an issue of where um, you know we we will respond to different developments. Um, you know, cultural heritage management plans might be developed, and we don't necessarily have a lot of time in order to work through those um, sorts of processes with our um, traditional owners, um, given the, um, the act and the regulations basically um, gives sometimes just less than a month to respond to a few different things. So that's, a, that's an issue as well that um, we're trying to tackle um, ongoing. And plus, um, you know, given the current COVID restrictions, you know, we're, we've still been under a lot of pressure to undertake um, and provide some of our services and respond to different developments, um, even though, uh, you know, uh, much of the state is um, closed down because of restrictions or have been affected as such. Plus, a lot of our community members are particularly affect, um, you know, vulnerable, I guess, to, um, you know, the COVID-19 virus and things like that. So, um, you know, that's been an interesting process as well in terms of making sure that um, any developers or um, heritage consultants that we work with have got um, you know really strong you know you know COVID nineteen um, plans I suppose in order to make sure that um, you know our people don't get infected um, through contact with others uh, on the job. So uh, yeah, there's some of the main issues we've faced I guess um, as a as a organisation you know for quite a number of years now and. Um, yeah, we're still trying to work through them. I, I sort of suggested earlier that um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of room to improve things, and Rodney's made that pretty clear as well. Obviously, in terms of making sure that um, you know we don't just stop here in terms of um, you know, what the Aboriginal Heritage Act can do and provide uh, for us in terms of recognising you know our rights and responsibilities to care for country. Um, that um, you know it needs to be a continuous development and um, improvement as we go along. So that's uh, pretty much my sort of little presentation um, at this stage. Thank you, Stuart. Amazing. I, we, as we're just waiting to get Susie back on line due to the connectivity issues, uh, Rodney, I was wondering whether you had any questions um, for Stuart following on from the, from the presentation. Um, not necessarily put you on the spot, Stewie, but um, the state provides some resourcing to registered Aboriginal parties, traditional owners, and uh, um, you then get constrained on having to meet the grant type agreement. If, if, if you had a greater opportunity for resourcing, what would you then apply that to in your cultural heritage uh, protection? Because I remember when we were younger, like things were more focused on us being closer to culture and doing activities, and now it it all seems rush, rush and CHMPs and that. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think uh, it gets back to the capacity building. So that um, at the moment, you know, we have, um, we really only have two traditional owners who are, are doing the bulk of our cultural heritage um, field work. So that involves, you know, site monitoring or inspections, things like that. So um, we would love, you know, more resources to be able to employ more people so that we can, um, I guess, you know, be in a better position to, you know, really sort of meet the requirements of being a wrap as well as our cultural requirements as well and, and ex expectations. Um, I guess plus, um, yeah, I think 
we, we do a lot of protecting of cultural heritage, but um, we'd love to sort of focus um, some of this stuff on in terms of maintaining cultural heritage and um, or, you know, uh, building you know, more of that into our daily lives as well. So that yeah. um, being not just a reactionary sort of, um, you know, protecting cultural heritage, but being a to be, be in a position to continue our cultural practices so that, um, you know, we're not just focused on protecting what was done in the past, but um, creating more, I suppose, and, um, you know, continuing the legacy of our ancestors. So Yeah. yeah it's interesting you'd say that because I've sort of found just, uh, I feel fortunate in growing up exposed closely to the culture, stories, the song, the dance, even making, you know, artifacts, Mm. Uh, um, yourself it's a real challenge to activate y you as a person that's conscious of it to to do it and and then i would think for our mob it's if some people are less fortunate it's even harder mm, absolutely it's a big issue and i think um yeah we all find ourselves in in jobs like ours where we're uh, a lot of our time is taken up trying to you know just um keep things moving whereas um we don't have a lot of time for ourselves to to really focus on those important things as well. So, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, perhaps more resourcing in terms of, um, you know, focus more on living culture um, yeah. would be would be a great way to go. And um, I know, you know, there's um, like for our group, you know, there's so many different family groups with their own traditions and way of doing things. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's enabling them as well, you know, from a family group perspective, not just from a, a BGLC organisational perspective, but um, to enable and resource family groups to do what they need to do at a, I guess, a clan level. So yeah, I think yeah. that's an important thing as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'd sort of see that mm. as being more uh, a family orientated. Mm. And then if you've got forms of leadership in your group, knowledge holders also, mm. how, how do you facilitate that to be shared, enjoyed? And, and I know with some of my mob to try and normalise our culture that, you know, it, it, it's not an, uh, an interesting thing. It's just a normal uh, thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. A good point. Um, so I think, um, yeah, definitely in terms of um, the resourcing side of things, I think, um, and I know, you know, we're going to have a lot of challenges economically, you know, in the state going forward from here, but um, definitely I think um, it needs to be on the table to try and, yeah, get more resourcing to help not just the the heritage protection, but also the living culture as we go forward. Mm. I um, got a recollection. There was the Tandrum uh, held at Gary Word, and I think you rocked mm. up. You'd made something. Do, do you recall what that was? Oh, geez, I don't know. Um, I think I was working on a shield yeah. at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's going back, though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Testing yeah. out the brain cells. Yeah. Over 20 years ago? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you don't know where that thing. shield landed? Uh, it's in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was an ongoing project. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, I've, I've enjoyed that myself. And I've seen a lot of our mob uh, um, practicing, you know, making the, the craft sort of stuff and, and more songs being created yeah. and dance. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, and I think you touched... But what you touched on there too, in terms of the previous Tandurum ceremonies that were held you know, around the state, I suppose, was, you know, I really miss those things. I think um, it'd be great to have, you know, more of a statewide sort of approach to getting people together, uh, you know, for cultural reasons um, that um, I think still happens to a certain extent with some groups, but um, certainly not from a statewide sort of perspective. And I think, um, yeah, that, that'd be something really worth uh, resourcing as well. Yeah. Um, the certificate for in Aboriginal cultural heritage that's run in our collaboration with the tribe, has any of your mob uh, participated in, in that? And I guess if they have, you know, do you think it's a good thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, we've had a number of people from our mob go through that over the years. And um, I think it's been a great uh, grounding for people. Um, I was commenting to a few people in the you know, recently that um, in the old days, you used to go out with the old people, like the elders and the experienced people, and you'd just tag along and you'd learn from that process. And 
I think, um, you know, it's been good to have, you know, more formalised sort of process to learn about, you know, cultural heritage management, especially under the sort of, you know, the, the, you know, the Aboriginal Heritage Act sort of, um, uh, you know, processes and things like that. But um, one thing I do miss and we don't provide as much anymore is the, the, the experience of having people go out with elders and, and experienced people uh, to learn about it in, in an informal way. And that's something we're trying to tackle as well is um, in terms of increasing capacities to um, yeah, have a focus on you know, transmission of knowledge yeah, through um, uh, yeah, those sorts, sorts of ways, not just through the, uh, the opportunities through that, um, you yeah, the higher learning, I guess. So, yeah. Just as, uh, and sorry about this, everyone, just as uh, Susie's on a little bit of a delay still, she says that apparently events in <laughs> Ballarat are being cancelled because of the lack of um, online connectivity at the moment. So I'll just step in to pose the question to you both, some of the ones that have come through in the chat. Um, what do you think needs to change the local and state government level in terms of how they work um, with Aboriginal, with registered Aboriginal parties um, to ensure that they're able to um, do what needs to be done and in a way that's, you know, respectful from a cultural community perspective. So uh, yeah, another, another issue we do have um, that we're trying to address as well is um, getting better relationships or more effective working relationships with local government and um, it's not always um, easy because um, yeah, we we have certain processes through you know, state government. You know, and everyone needs to abide by those. But um, there's a fair bit of grey area or leeway in terms of how people go about it. And um, so we're we're really keen to improve you know, our um, relationship with um, local government. Uh, we have a number of different local governments. Um, over Wajabalik country and yeah, we we need to, um, you know, create better relationships and better working relationships with a lot of those um, local councils to, in order to make sure that we're, um, you know, protecting cultural heritage and they're doing what they can to protect our cultural heritage as well. So um, it is a, an ongoing process. And I think um, from my point of view, you know, it's something where the state can help out a little bit more in terms of, uh, helping local government, whether it be through resourcing them to be able to engage properly, but um, certainly, you know, it's something that we're going to be looking to also be resourced further in terms of, you know, being able to, you know, uh, you know, dedicate, um, you know, resources towards doing, uh, you know, better consultation and collaboration with local government. That's a really good point, Stu. Also, think that for some of our registered Aboriginal parties, the engagement is only because you have to, uh, 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 as a planning type requirement, development and landscape. And uh, I reckon a brilliant future for us is for local governments where they can and they should uh, develop the relationship. I think in, in the respect of and affording the rights recognition to traditional owners, the registered Aboriginal party. And I think for our, our people, it, it's somewhat being uh, an invaded and occupied people on their land. So like that, for my mind, is easier said today than it would have been for our ancestors. And, and hopefully when you suggest things like this, people grapple and, and, and try and in their own mind put themselves in our position and think, well, you know, first people actually have a really good thing to contribute and, and they have a responsibility. So let's empower. And, and that's what I think self-determination is about. Local governments, I think, uh, have a brilliant opportunity because largely I think of them even as our Aboriginal corporations where we've got uh, directors, which are family representatives, councils have got wards, and people they elect for periods of time in their representation. I, I, I believe that that can come together uh, uh, with some creative thought. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And um, yeah, there's such huge scope there. And I know 
from you know some of the things we've done with local governments in the past um, over the years there's some re been really good outcomes and um, but it's not always done on a consistent basis yeah. and um, and that's what we're trying to get to I guess and, and I'd say you no, know, not not just us. Obviously, I think it's probably a statewide issue. Is that um, yeah? Obviously, relationships vary in terms of you know across the state, but but certainly I think um, yeah, there's great scope for improvement in how um, you know local government engages with traditional owners. Yeah. I think um, just putting it out there, we love our language and passionate about it. We're all going through forms of reclamation learning, speaking, singing, to have language uh, back in country and, you know, signage and those sort of things, namings are, are, are the vehicles. I, I think that is brilliant because for my mind, it goes to the foundation of, of First Peoples identity, Australian identity. We travel the world and we want to speak other people's language and we've already got languages uh, uh, here. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, yeah, language is a big part of, um, you know, cultural heritage, cultural identity. Um, it's directly related to caring for country. It's one of those important um, you know, aspects that, um, yeah, like we're, we're trying to, you know, we have a language program ourselves for the guy language and, you know, it's an ongoing process to get that, um, you know, sort of um, working well. And yeah, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's a fair bit of reclamation, yeah, good, how are you? Language. But um, yeah, we'll continue on with all that sort of stuff, but it's um, yeah, definitely a key part of yeah, um, or, or what we do. Right. Travis and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Rodney and Stuart are um, picking up as we, as we <laughs> go. I'm just sort of trying to... I'm really enjoying having a yarn with you, Stuart. I hope others <laughs> uh, uh, enjoy it because I can't do the technology with the questions. I'm sorry. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. It's just like you and me here, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I presume there's a whole heap of other questions around, but um yeah. I tell you what, like a cultural thing, you know, as we reclaim language, we speak it, you know, we use it some amongst our models. We say you talk to country. Well, how, how do you talk to country? You need to do it in language. Because now language actually understands the meaning behind the words. You know, you, you pronounce, you sing country and, and, and very simply f words phrased together. And then when you chant, our culture, our ancestors tell us that's what country needs to heal country. And I'd sort of, mm. when I do it with someone, I actually feel like I'm healing myself. You know? yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think just a holistic um, healing, isn't it, really? Um, I think you're right. It gets back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of you know, having the, the time and the freedom to be able to, to do that sort of cultural maintenance and, um, you know, caring for country in that regard. So it's, yeah, it's such a huge thing. And, um, yeah, so like I said, we're very focused on protecting, you know, what we have. Um, but, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more focus on, programs to be able to yeah um revive and um and build on our cultural heritage as well yeah and to be able to like live it so you've mm. got that that freedom in your mind and your spirit to do it yeah um, that that's extremely healing yeah and it's absolutely. brilliant when you see older people when we do stuff that's you know we can celebrate in all those forms there's community and the older people are present, you can uh, uh, um, almost see the pride, you know, just yeah. how how well they feel because their lives were so different, you know, to, mm. to ours, I guess, and our children's. Yeah, yeah, I think it's sort of funny because um, in, t in terms of, um, like, we're probably in a really good position now to be able to do a lot of, you know, cultural maintenance and reclamation of language and all that sort of stuff, but... Um, we, we seem to have less time to do stuff. So it's, yeah. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a, a sort of a vicious cycle in a way. But, um, but yeah, that's the world we live in, I guess. And we've got to find a way. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about that time. I think I'm lucky with my involvements with me, Mob, and with Council to keep your, your eye on the, on, 
it's frustrating as it is not to deal with immediate issues. You need some of your mob focusing on the long term, the long game, mm. to, to have process in place that things will get better and, and to help people that have been subject to generational trauma deal with the calmness that, that's needed actually as we plan life and, and mm. go forward. So, you know, future generations, and again, this is a cultural thing, that um, our grandchildren inherit something better than than we currently maybe have or don't have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you know how to do the technology, Stuart? Um, oh. so, so I think I've found so the question, oh, yeah. Q&A bit. So um, maybe if I just... Can answer some of them? Or if you yeah, maybe. It? Yeah. Um, uh, what have we got here? Um, There's two chats going. <laughs> yeah. A good question. Yeah. Um, so I've got one here that's about um, how can natural resource management programs work better with traditional owners in a way well, that supports self determination? That's sort of like the other side of uh, caring for country, I, I suppose. Um, like in, in my area of work, I, I manage both um, sort of natural resource management and, um, and cultural heritage protection. So um, a, a key part of uh, what I do and um, uh, people in part of the team that I'm in is um, it was also natural resource management. So it's dealing with Parks Victoria and DELP. Um, and in our area, I think we've got a, a pretty good relationship with those bodies. And, um, but again, there's always opportunities and, and potential to improve those relationships. So, um, yeah, we've worked on, I guess, you know, getting um, traditional burning as, as part of um, the way people think about caring for country and, and looking after country. And I think that's, um, I know a number of groups, you know, around the state have been getting into that um, as well. So. I think that's been a really good um, yeah, initiative. Uh, but yeah, I think um, yeah, we, we definitely want to you know, get to a position because we do have a, a range of crew that um, you know, is in a position to say, take up um, work contracts for pest plant and animal work um, through um, you know, potentially through Parks Victoria and DELP. So that's uh, you know, an ongoing um, you know, sort of aspiration, I guess, is to get into a position to, yeah, uh, take up some of those contracts and provide work for our mob working on country. Yeah, that's brilliant, Stu, because mm. our, our mob sometimes is so uh, challenged or disadvantaged in, in stuff. And I think the uh, um, beauty of our contribution and culture, you know, is so significant. But others get challenged to understand they've got all, they've got the, the rights, the resources, to devolve and share, like principal sharing, to, to the mob that now you can be empowered to do, you still get the outcome, but it's just done our way. So if it was an investment, I would think now we can uh, contribute something significant in our culture to, to the outcome. And others can't immediately do that until they build a partnership with us. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Fire is an interesting uh, uh, idea. A lot of mobs across the state we've seen now that we've got the um, traditional owner cultural burning strategy. I see that as a vehicle uh, uh, for us to be doing culture with with, with fire and, and yeah. to to potentially use that uh, um, for a whole range of things like uh, uh, the benefit of species, like the grasses, yeah. are something that's so fragile and fragmented in Victoria and all the conversation now is around, you know, the, the, the native grains and native uh, uh, breads and we can have that here. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, and I think, uh, yeah, in some of our area uh, traditionally would have been large areas of grasslands that have now been uh, depleted or destroyed. So um, we, we only have in, in our country really, there's not a lot of, um, you know, I guess proper grasslands left. Um, uh, some of them occur on roadsides, things like that. So you know, the, 
the um, management of those is going to be interesting as we go along um, because as you say like um, traditional burning cultural burning can can really uh, have a positive effect on you know, native species and um, yeah, it's really something that we're keen to explore and I know you I think in judge run country mm. you guys have got um, probably a bit more in terms of grasslands than what we do but um, yeah we're, we're pretty keen to try and uh, yeah restore some of those places as well Mm. Um, I just had a question too from here. I think there was a question about um, give us a bit more detail about BGLC members, how many people, mm. what clans, what activities does it engage in? So I guess um, I'm not sure what the membership list of the BGLC membership is at the moment. Um, it always seems to be more and more people becoming members. Um, so that, and I think uh, one of the processes we're trying to go through is to try and reconnect with our traditional owners um, more broadly so that, um, you know, we can meet their needs and, and uh, aspirations. So it's something we're encouraging people to do is to, you know, if you're a Wajabalik person or one of the five groups, um, you know, to contact us and, um, you know, I guess, you know, make contact and, yeah, maybe become a member and keep... Um, you know, helps to keep up to um, speed with what's going on uh, and makes us stronger as well. Um, so, and I've just had a pop-up message from someone saying um, there's about 320 BGLC members. So that Solid. Was, that was from my um, CEO who's, who's obviously <laughs> watching. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, look, uh, what clans I suppose is, depends on what you define as a clan is, but um I guess, yeah, you know, we have the five main groups that have, that have been mentioned already as part of our group. And um, as a part of that, um, there's, there's a number of different family groups who are recognised, um, you know, through uh, our, our board. So uh, board membership is basically representation from the main family groups um, from our mob. Um, and in terms of activities, uh, I guess um, there are a number of activities that can be engaged in but it's mainly from uh yeah you know, i guess a, a works or or um yeah mainly a work sort of uh perspective in terms of people getting involved in in what we do in terms of cultural heritage or land management uh areas like that and it's something that we want to con continue to develop um bglc is going through a restructure and has gone through a restructure recently to um yeah, I guess increase the capacity of the organisation to, uh, you know, I guess, you know, develop, um, you know, community programs, you know, cultural programs, things like that. So it's an ongoing process and we're just sort of working our way through that restructure at the moment. And uh, yeah, hopefully that will uh, bear fruit as we go along. Sounds brilliant. All right, I'll just come up on that again. I'm just seeing the top next top question that's coming through was sort of new ideas about how we can apply caring for country principles um, in an urban or um, towns or suburban context across the um, the areas um, the Beringa Gajin covers. Yeah, I think um, I think it's always sort of hard to you know, connect to nature and country in an urban environment. And I think um, that's a challenge that some of our you know, traditional owners, particularly those who, um, you know, live off country, say in Melbourne and other urban areas, is they continually have that, um, you know, I guess the, the disconnect from country that, um, and, and the connection to country is really important to our, our people. And um, so, and, and I think um, it's fair to say that um, uh, we need to acknowledge the effect that the COVID restrictions have had on our mobs in urban areas around Melbourne uh, as well, is that um, you know, it's really affected people's you know, well-being uh, in terms of not just having the freedom of movement, but um, the, the ability to come back on country and reconnect. And I think, um, that's so, you know, I guess um, you know, we need to acknowledge that um, you know, the restrictions can affect everyone, but uh, I think 
you know, our traditional owners, you know, have a have a particular it has a, a particular effect on our traditional owners in terms of um, how they feel and how, you know how how they um, you know connect uh, back to culture and country. It's such an important thing, and um, and so yeah, I guess um, in terms of being able to care for country, I suppose you know it's hard to do things from urban areas, but um, so the, the principles still apply though in terms of um, caring for country is sort of like you know caring for your local environment. So you know, it's, it's caring for you know, how you, you know, manage your waste, for example, you know, recycling, all those sorts of things, as, as I see it, in terms of living in the modern world. And, um, but, and there's other things that people can do as well, I suppose. But um, I, I do recognise the challenges that people face in that regard. Jeez, it's funny that you, when you talk about recyclables, I've noticed, uh, and, and my oldest daughter's brilliant, like, Dad, you got to recycle everything. So if something breaks mm. like a machine, she <laughs> says, no, Dad, you can't throw it away. You have to yeah. fix it. And, and I think that's okay. Um, mm. But we've in decreased the amount of hard rubbish, but I've seen the increase in our recyclables. So not the organics, the non-organic. So it's it's just helped us as a family think in our consumption, what we do, um, we, we're going to try and get away from uh, uh, plastics to whatever natural uh, is. And look, there's peaks and troughs and all of this. When I grew up, you know, glass was this miracle thing that was created after the, you know, around the tin can. And, <laughs> you know, we can recycle all that stuff. And then, yeah, you know, that, that all sort of changed along the way. But sorry, mm -hmm. that's me being a bit wacky there. <laughs> <laughs> Can't beat a paper bag, but you can't punch your way out of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are awesome answers. I think we've got time for maybe one more, one more question, um, which I might go down and let, if you check the list of questions, if there's anything that you're particularly interested in. I noted Rodney. Uh, the question to you, you've mentioned that the current act doesn't meet the UN cultural heritage standards. Um, what would you like to see improved or changed um, particularly around to meet, to meet those standards? So the, the United Nations De Declaration uh, for Indigenous People uh, is a really high bar. Uh, um, its height though is actually appropriate it's it's uh, um, the right thing to do. So the challenge then, when you think about the standards of the current legislation, uh, um, how ready is the powerful, the regulator, as we move forwards to this idea of uh, um, transitions of subserviency, shared responsibility and dominance. And I don't use the word dominance uh, as an example to overpower, but um, we expect this in all things in our lives. And me and Stewie touched on in our small talk, um, enabling the leadership to be able to lead and appropriately resourcing. So an act in legislation needs that in, in, in itself. And, and then uh, ensuring that leadership is held to account uh, uh, in providing uh, um, you know, the, the needs of, of the people, of the community and what you do. So an act can be thought of in, in that sense and, and the resourcing. So now that's community, that's family, that's people, that's empowerment, self-determination. So we're really sort of, sort of close. Um, and, and I think, uh, 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 not handballing, but referring back to the council's discussion paper, when that gets out there and people can look at it, and I really suggest you, you take the time to read it uh, uh, and ask questions, you know, digest the information. That's the way that we'll all work together, traditional owners and the wider community that we share this responsibility going forward. And, and I think that that would be brilliant. That's, that's fantastic. And Stuart, I guess the last one coming through probably really relevant for yourself. Um, is 
just on the touching on the ways that um, Barangay Gadjin is collecting its knowledge on ecology and environmental um, issues, which would help with the assessment and management of country. Would you be able to elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I guess it's an ongoing process. Um, yeah, so um, if we're involved in you know different you know, land management projects, any research or things like that. Um, yeah, we're always gaining learnings from them. And um, so, yeah, I guess um, we're, what we do lack at the moment, um, you know, is probably, you know, greater opportunities, which sort of leads into our previous discussions around the ability to, you know, get people together and undertake cultural practices, um, uh, you know, as a mob, I guess. Um, so, I know that um, you know it's part of the aspirations of our our mob through our country planning um, uh, processes. You know, so we have a country plan um, that sort of outlines you know the main broad aspirations of our our people uh, going forward, and um, all of the things around you know documenting cultural knowledge is is documented there. You know, like it's uh, there are very clear aspirations and. Um, so some of what we do does that, but you know it's an ongoing process, and we we need to build those things into you know I guess yeah uh, what we do um, as we go along, and yeah hopefully um, as we build as an organisation, um, as our capacity increases, you know we'll be able to do more of those sorts of things. All right. Well, in the absence of our hosts, as we are as we're drawing to the <laughs> as we're drawing to the end um, of today's session, I just wanted to thank um, both Rodney and Stuart, particularly particularly um, Stuart. It's amazing to get um, such in depth um, knowledge and perspective um, from Barangay Gajin, and um, yeah, we're really thankful for um, you being able to make the make the time to speak to us um, today. We've got a, a well, series oh. of these webinars coming up shortly. Um, so the next one is on Friday the 9th of October with Rural Land Council. So we hope that you can join us for that as well. So they'll, they'll have learned from my mistakes. Hey, that's how we improve, Stuart, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you all again. We'll, we will close it there. Hope you can join us next time. And our thanks again to, to Rodney and to Stuart. No, thank, thank you. you. Great catching up, Stuart. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> See ya. Thank right you. Bye.